Everyone, this three questions with Dr. Donia Ball. There you go. Got a little music. All right. Oh, Donia Ball, Dr. Donia Ball. And you actually told me not to call you doctor, which I find fascinating. Whereas, because if I <laughs> actually went through all that work, you'd be, I would be just doctor. I would change my name just to doctor. You're like, kidding me. Oh, no, I don't baby. think, just a lot I don't of, think your friends and family would ever say just doctor. You'd be well, like, no, they wouldn't, but you know, it's just all the extra work that you had to do to get that. you right. That's a big deal. So I, you know, that's a lot of work. So Dr. Donia Ball has written the book, Adjusting the Sales. It's the first in a series of three. Um, but we're focusing on this book today because we know the other two are coming out uh, later. And so before we get into the three questions, first of all, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for um, having me, George. Tell us a little bit about uh, Adjusting the Sales. What, what is this book about? Who is it meant to help? So Adjusting the Sales, as you said, is the first of a leadership series of books. And it is the flagship book that basically talks about all of the storms, the leadership storms that every leader, whether they're in their right. first year, second year, that they're going to encounter at some point in their career, and then the how, how to basically navigate and sail through each of the storms. So like, did you predict COVID? Did that happen in this book? Did you like- that? Guess that you actually, a, there's a, a chapter- pandemic? There's a chapter on disasters. So it could be a natural disaster. It could be a medical disaster. So absolutely. I love that. And that's a, well, no, I don't love the disaster part, but I love the, we don't love the disaster part. I love, uh, you know, there's a lot of times where there is no kind of what happens if this happens, how do we do that? So I, I'm really excited to talk more about this book to kind of hear more about it. But before yeah. we get into the book, uh, we do want to start with the three questions. So I know um, you've worked as a, a teacher, vice principal, principal, you've done other jobs outside mm -hmm. of education. You're currently a superintendent. You look back at your career, you look at all of the inspiring teachers that you've worked with, maybe the ones you've had, who is a teacher that really inspired you and why? My fifth grade teacher at Crestwood Elementary School in Visalia, Kathy Carlos, Mrs. Carlos, she was hands down my all-time favorite teacher. You know, she'll still show up, George, in my dreams every now and again. <laughs> and it's not in a creepy uh, way. Yeah. It's like a really no, special way. Right. Um, Kathy had, Mrs. Carlos had this phenomenal ability to connect to the human heart of the kids. And this is what I mean by that. It wasn't just about, you know, the learning in the classroom. Mm -hmm. She would, on weekends, she would have events at the school and she would connect us in so many ways to learning outside of the four walls of the classroom that later on as an administrator, as, you know, a school and district leader, I would always think mm. about Mrs. Carlos and be like, if we could do that back then even with all the restrictions and red tape and, you know, legislation that, that sometimes feels like we're handcuffed. Um, we can absolutely be creative because at the end of the day, we want our kids, even when they're not in school hours to feel like they're looking forward right. to being there. And oftentimes I would argue probably 99% of the time it's because of a teacher or a mm. staff member that makes them feel 100% included. And there's just this love of learning. It may not be a love of a specific subject area, but it's a love of the people of what's happening at that school. And that's really, I think the influence that Kathy basically imparted with all of our students, certainly with me. Kathy Carlos, little shout out. There we go. This Kathy. Kathy Carlos, is that, is that a Greek name? Is that a Greek name? Sounds very really Greek. You know, I don't know, Probably but Greek. you would know if it's Greek or not. It so I defer Greek. to you. Yeah, it sounds very Greek. So the I, I'm, I'm reading, or I just finished reading Will Godara's uh, Unreasonable Hospitality. And he shares a piece of advice in his book. And it comes from his dad. He said, uh, his dad basically said, happiness is, the secret of happiness is always having something to look forward to. Yeah, right. And, yeah. and that, 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 you know, really powerful to kind of make sure that we have those, um, 
not necessarily events, but those moments, those, those opportunities. Uh, it's funny because you, you say about kind of the red tape that we have to get through. And I think there's just so much more. And I, I, I wish we, we as school districts would try to get rid of that. Cause we kind of just add red tape constantly and never take it off. Cause I, I grew up in a time where like, we didn't have supervision at recess. It was just kind of like, kids were just like, okay, we'll see you in 50 minutes. We're going to go. Smoke. Exactly. <laughs> right. I don't know if that. That was like a legit thing in our school, right? Kid, teachers totally. would go smoke in the staff room or whatever, yeah. and, you know, and it, and then we were just kind of, you know, and now it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's just crazy. So I, 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 I feel it's a lot harder to do that, but it, it's no less important. So I appreciate you, you sharing that message. Okay. Totally. So you've, you've done tons of roles in admin. You're currently a superintendent. I'm sure you've worked with some inspiring administrators. I, I guarantee you, and I've had enough guests on to know this too probably had people you're like eh, I don't want to, I don't want to which be like, by either. the way I feel like we learn even more from those yeah, leaders that totally. we don't um want to emulate later down the road right yeah. we're like if yeah. I do that then I'm going to be perceived like him or her and so those in itself are like huge huge takeaways totally and I, I think that a lot of people when they say to me like I don't want to go to man because I don't want to do those things I'm like you don't have to do those things right that exactly that's, that's, how, that's their personality. That's their responsibility, but you are kind of in charge. So you have a lot more flexibility to do things the way that you see uh, would best suit your staff and the people you serve. So saying all that, who is yeah. an administrator that really inspired you and why? So I would have to say Renee Whitson. And actually, you know, what's amazing about this is that she was probably my very first real leadership mentor. Mm -hmm. When I was a teacher, she was the one that basically tapped me on the back and said, I really see something in you that is beyond what you're currently doing now. And what's so awesome, fast forward to, you know, now a couple decades later, I just had the awesome experience of traveling with her hmm. up to Northern California. She's been retired for many years and we just had the best time now as friends, right. just reminiscing and talking because I truly feel like once a mentor, always a mentor, once a coach, always a coach. And you just never forget about these people, but you always want them to feel like you had such a ro made rock solid right. difference in my life. And now just having this time together, that's not structured for us to reminisce. It was like such a, an insanely special experience. But the reason why she was super influential in my life, and I know many other leaders' lives, is because she, it's just unheard of to be a superintendent in a district, right? For more than a few years, mm -hmm. right? We see it, it come and go, mass exodus, job hopping all over the place. And she was a superintendent for like over 20 years in the district that I was in at mm. the time because of her love and passion. And she was like, why, why would I leave right. when I, this is my home. But what was really special is that she had an assistant superintendent where politically we knew they were not on the same page. They were mm. very different women serving in partnership but at the end of the day, they were so cohesive and unified that as a young leader and as a teacher at the time, I was like, that is good leadership. Right. We, they, we knew that their, their core values were a little bit different. Their, their thoughts, their beliefs were a little bit different. We knew behind the scenes, I wanted to be a fly on the wall so many times mm -hmm when they would be, you know, like talking about certain things. Cause I'm like, you know, they're disagreeing, you know, they're heated, you know, they're passionate, but yeah. when they would come out and it was showtime with, with, with site district admin, with the board, with the community, you would have never, ever known mm -hmm. how very different these women were. But that to me was such a solid example mm -hmm. right out of the gate of what leadership is about. All right. Renee Whitson, if you're listening, give you, a little, give you that little shout out. That Cheers, is such Renee. A, that's such a powerful story because I, this, when I, when I was first hired as a principal and I've shared the story many, many times, uh, I could not have been more opposite 
of a person than the person who hired me. Yeah. And I was kind of shocked that he hired me in the first place. And he basically said, I hired you because you'll see things and you'll attract people that I don't. And, yes. and then when I hired my first uh, assistant principal and I became principal, I did the exact same thing. And, you know, if you, we don't need carbon copies of ourselves because we already are there, but we also have to have, you know, share a vision of like, Hey, we're here to help kids. And so finding sometimes that solution in the middle, and that's something that's needed more and more because, um, it's like, Hey, we want, we, we want people that think exactly the same as us. And it's like, well, then why even hire them? That's just a kind of waste of energy. We need people with different perspectives, different experiences and, exactly. and different thoughts. Um, you know, kind of bringing people together and kind of finding sometimes that, uh, that middle ground that mm -hmm. is, is, is lacking, uh, sometimes in education, obviously politically, 100%. And I think people need this more and more. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. And, um, it, it, you know, if you're, if you're listening right now and you're in disagreement with this, you're not looking for different perspectives. You're looking just to be reaffirmed. And I think mm -hmm. part of it too, is that that doesn't necessarily bode well for leadership and it doesn't bode well for, you know, we want kids to be critical thinkers as long as they say exactly what we tell them. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh. Well, and I'll tell you, George, one of the things that I enjoy the most, and a lot of people will be like, you know, you're crazy, is that we, you know, we love to sit around in education and certainly not just education, but we love mm -hmm. to sit around and we love to gripe and complain about how things are about the red tape, right? And one of the things that I love the most is to go up to Sacramento, get into the room with yep. legislators and talk to them. And there's definitely disagreement in that room. Yep. And they do not always, most often actually, see eye to eye. But to me, it's super fascinating to yep. understand why there's that belief system, why laws, right, policies, are the way that they are. And if we could just share more stories with respect, like right. what you and I are talking about and yeah. understanding perspective, I actually think people would be surprised how much we actually do agree yeah. with each other. I agree. And I agree with the importance of disagreement. <laughs> 100%. Makes sense. All right. Love it. Okay. So last question. Yeah. Uh, you have lots of different experiences. You've had lots of great people that you worked with. And I'm sure if you go back to your first year of teaching, there's things that you're embarrassed by just as every person that's listening to this. Right. And you'd say like, Oh, don't do that. Or like, I could have done that better. So if you go back, talk to Dr. Donia ball, who wasn't a doctor, right? No, he's not a doctor. What <laughs> advice would you give to your first year teacher self? You know, I think I'm going to, this is probably going to be not as expected as what you would ask when a, a response right. is what you would get from other people. Dramatic. But <laughs> during that first year, take up a new extracurricular thing. Okay. Okay. And like this is where I'm going with that. Outside of school. Outside of school. Outside okay. of school. So if it's running, run. If it's golf, right. golf, whatever that is. Because burnout is real, right? right? And the amount of time, intensive moments that are going to keep you weekends, nights, right? Sundays that you would normally be out doing these extracurricular things, you will be tied 100% those early years mm -hmm. to the classroom, planning, collaborating, grading, whatever it is. And if you have something, whatever it is, that like really gets you going, that is like another goal, mm -hmm. it keeps you so importantly grounded and yep. a little bit more, you're never going to be balanced, right? And that's probably not what we strive for. There's going to be way more time, 80, 90% of time in the classroom working our tails off. But if you have that little thing, it will just help with the overwhelming feeling of I'm sinking right. in this new role as a teacher. I love that. And, uh, there, I, I can't, I cannot remember where I heard this from, 
uh, but they're, they were talking about the importance of distraction. Yes. And we think of distraction as like a negative thing, like spending too much time on your phone and stuff like that. And they said, you know, it's kind of it's the importance of identifying like a negative distraction and a positive distraction, right? So when I go for a run, I don't really think about my work. I don't think about stuff. So it's a distraction that's actually leading to something beneficial with my health or things like that. So kind of finding those positive distractions, yes. uh, you know, to because I think when we get so consumed in what we do in our work, um, then we get, that's when we kind of check out and things like that too. And yeah. it's really important. I think, you know, as we were talking about administrators earlier, that people support this too, right? This, this 100%. idea, and there's a mentality that, you know, if I'm not totally 100% focused on my job that I, I how, like, you know, other people will be, and they'll be better at that. And the reality of it is that they might be for a little while and then they get burnt out and then you just kind of yeah. replace them with somebody else. And th that necessarily isn't a good thing, right? It's, yeah. it's helping people, you know, grow into the best version of themselves, both in and out. I agree. And it's so easy if we're not intentional no. to lose ourselves in the whatever, right? In mm -hmm. as being a teacher, as being an administrator, especially those first, that first year or those first few years. And so what has to be intentional and very strategic is having that other thing, whatever it is, as a powerful distraction, mm -hmm. but it's such a healthy distraction. And I don't know anyone that would say that that would be a bad thing, right? right. Just, I mean, obviously, if it's something that wasn't good for your mind, body, or soul, that right. could be a little bit controversy, right. controversial. Right. But typically, like taking up drinking might not be the best. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that. Right. But it's happened. It's happened. It has. It right. has. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Well, I, well, hey, I, I appreciate you being on here. And uh, it, anyone you, who's George. listening, uh, check out the book, Adjusting the Sales. You'll see it actually in the link in the description down below. Don, Donia, thank you so much for thank you, being George. on the podcast. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, and I hope you have a, a wonderful day as we play the outro. Yeah.